The message for this Good Friday is taken from Colossians chapter 2 and verse 14. Colossians chapter 2, I'll be reading the entire passage so that you can see in context this incredible verse, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. Before I read that entire text, let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, once again we thank you for the privilege of having our sins nailed to the cross of Christ. The ordinances that were against us, that were contrary to us, being taken out of the way, being nailed to the cross. And Father, how we thank you that through that our Lord Jesus Christ spoiled principalities and powers and made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. The victory of the cross. Father, we pray for your blessings upon this, your word, as we study it this day. And as you take your word and transform our hearts by the Spirit of God. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. 
beginning in verse 13, to put it in its context, and you being dead in your trespasses and sins, and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. And having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. Let no man therefore judge you in meat, or in drink, or in respect of an holy day, or of the new moon, or of the Sabbath days, which are a shadow of things to come. But the body is of Christ. Let no man beguile you of your reward in a voluntary humility and worshipping of angels intruding into those things which he hath not seen, vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind, and not holding the head, from which all the body, by joints and bands, having nourishment ministered and knit together, increaseth with the increase of God. There's much more within this text that we do not have time to cover today, but that gives to us the context, the important context of what the Apostle Paul is writing to the church at Colossae and drawing their attention back to the cross, nailed to the cross. The Gospel writers have told us clearly and specifically what was nailed to the cross of Christ. A few verses from Matthew Verses 35 through 38 in chapter 27, they crucified him, parted his garments, casting lots, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet. They parted my garments among them, and upon my vesture did they cast lots. And sitting down, they watched him there, and set up over his head his accusation written, This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Then were there two thieves crucified with him, one on the right hand and the other on the left. In Mark, we see again an emphasis on what was nailed to the cross. It was the third hour, and they crucified him, and the superscription of his accusation was written over the king of the Jews. And with him they crucified two thieves, the one on his right hand and the other on the left. Jumping down to verse 32, we find the mockery, let Christ, the King of Israel, his accusation is the King of the Jews, and now they are mocking him, let Christ, the King of Israel, now descend from the cross, that we may see and believe, and they that were crucified with him reviled him. In Luke, Luke tells us some more details about this accusation. The soldiers also mocked him, coming to him and offering him vinegar and saying, If thou be the king of the Jews, so this comes not merely from the mouth of the Sanhedrin, the Jewish leaders who are sitting there and watching him, but it is also coming from the mouth of the soldiers. The soldiers also mocked him, coming to him and offering him vinegar and saying, If thou be the king of the Jews, save thyself. And a superscription also was written over him, and here Luke gives us the added detail in letters of Greek and Latin and Hebrew. This is the king of the Jews. John also gives us, as we've read a moment ago, in chapter 19 of his gospel, another description of what was nailed to the cross. Speaking of Pilate, then delivered he him therefore unto them to be crucified, and they took Jesus and led him away. And he, bearing his cross, went forth into a place called the place of a skull, which is called in Hebrew Golgotha. There they crucified him, and two other with him on either side one, and Jesus in the midst. And Pilate wrote a title and put it on the cross. And the writing was, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. This title then read many of the Jews, for the place where Jesus was crucified was nigh to the city, and it was written in Hebrew and Greek and Latin. Then said the chief priests of the Jews to Pilate, Write not the King of the Jews, but that he said, I am King of the Jews. 
Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. The document nailed above the head of Christ on the cross is described in detail for us by all four of the Gospel writers. The fact that all four mention it is very, very significant because it's rare to find a specific detail that is mentioned in all four of the Gospels. The first three Gospels, which are called the Synoptic Gospels, often record similar details of the same events. But the Gospel of John only does so on very rare occasions, and this is one of those occasions. John, in fact, gives us the greatest detail of what was written. Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Matthew records the next longest part of that superscription. This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Luke abbreviates it to, this is the King of the Jews. Mark, as usual in his narrative, is the shortest of all, the King of the Jews. And so as we see in John's Gospel, we have a full description of who this one is, who is being crucified. It is a very specific Jesus. It is Jesus of Nazareth. This is the one who is the king of the Jews. We know two more things from that statement. Number one, that it was written. Very important, as we'll see in a moment. And number two, where it was nailed. It was a superscription. It was above him. It was written above him. We are told specifically it was above his head on the cross. We find that it was over his head. There are several other key facts that we must notice if we would understand the full significance of our text today in Colossians. First, this thing that was written was an accusation. It was a legal document. It was a legal document executed by the highest secular law of the land at that time. Pilate himself was the governor of Judea. He was the highest man in that jurisdiction. A legal document. Second, it was an immutable legal writing that could not be changed to please the Jews. Then said the chief priests of the Jews to Pilate, Write not the king of the Jews, but that he said, I am the king of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. A trial has been held, an accusation has been made. Witness has been brought, though twisted. A determination has been made based upon the accusation. And now the sentence is being executed based upon the accusation by which Jesus is being found guilty. A legal document, an immutable legal writing. Third, it was a public legal document. Pilate wrote a title and put it on the cross, and the writing was, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. This title then read, Many of the Jews, for the place where Jesus was crucified was nigh to the city. This was a public legal document. It was written in Hebrew, Greek, and Latin. And that brings us to the fourth observation. This was an international legal document. It was written in Hebrew and Greek and Latin. This was meant for all the world to know, to see, and to feel the effects of the cross. Rome only meant it for a day. God meant it for eternity. Fifth, it was a legal document stating the absolute facts of the case upon which the accused was tried and convicted. The writing was Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Both Matthew and Mark make it clear that this was the accusation upon which Jesus Christ was tried and convicted under Roman law. 
and set up over his head his accusation written, This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Matthew 27, 37. Mark 15, 26. And the superscription of his accusation was written over the King of the Jews. Matthew and Mark tell us that he was crucified between two thieves. How, other than by divine revelation, would it have been known that these men were thieves rather than murderers, rapists, scam artists, embezzlers, counterfeiters, rebels against Caesar, or international drug dealers? The answer is obvious. They too would have had their accusations upon which they had been tried with a legal Roman trial and for which they had been convicted and had that accusation nailed above their heads on their crosses too. Why did the Romans nail the accusations of, at the top of the crosses where they crucified criminals? You see, this was not unique to our Lord's cross. The crucifixion of Christ was not a unique punishment invented on the spur of the moment. The Jews certainly knew about crucifixion. Their religious leaders had whipped the mob into a frenzy, screaming, Crucify him! Crucify him! Pilate didn't have to ask the mob, Well, what do you mean by crucifixion? Crucifixion was the standard Roman method of capital punishment. Josephus writes that the Romans on one occasion crucified several thousand Jews and lined the roads with their crosses leading to Jerusalem. Those were Jews who were condemned in an uprising which was crushed by the Romans. The Romans were masters of crucifixion. Think about this. You wonder why the Romans would do this? Crucifixion was not like beheading. One swift blow, instantaneous death, and then the crowd disappears. It was not like the electric chair in private with a small panel of witnesses and a medical doctor to pronounce the prisoner dead. There were five things that characterized crucifixion. Number one, it was public high above the crowd so that everyone could see and so that none could interfere, visible in some cases for miles. It was public. Number two, it was protracted, sometimes lasting for days in the case of strong men who had not first been beaten. The agony of up and down on the cross, trying to catch a breath, trying to avoid suffocation, screaming out in pain. It was protracted, public, protracted, and it was painful, with the spikes being driven through the sensitive nerves and muscles, and the agony piercing every part of the body. The Romans knew what they were doing. Fourth, it was preventative. The Romans used this method because it was designed to strike fear into the hearts of those who saw these men, and sometimes women, suffering. Perhaps it would be a loved one that was there, a brother, a father, a son. There would normally be a, a matter of bitterness and hatred in seeing something like this happen to a loved one. But there would be the reminder day after day as criminals were tried and executed. If you break Roman law, this is what will happen to you. If you try to get revenge, this is what will happen to you. It was preventative. Fifthly, it was prolific. It was prolific. Everybody knew that the Romans meant business about obeying the law and that they would kill you in the most painful way if you broke the law. The law, the law, the law. Rome was famous for its laws and for its system of justice. The systematic iron boot of Rome crushed to powder any who opposed their armies or who broke their laws. Public protracted, painful, preventative, prolific. 
And this is why the Apostle Paul uses the allusion to crucifixion in our text today. Pilate nailed an accusation to the cross of Christ. It was an accusation upon which he was tried, convicted, and sentenced to death. Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. But Paul speaks of something else that was nailed to the cross. It was not nailed there by Pilate. It was not the preferred version that the Jews wanted nailed to the cross. It was something that God the Father himself nailed to the cross of Christ. Listen to that verse again in context. Buried with him in baptism, where you also are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God who hath raised him from the dead. The operation of God who hath raised him from the dead, and you, being dead in your sins and uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. That's one continued extended thought from that first phrase that we saw, the operation of God. God is the one who is doing the action in each of these stages as we move from verse 12 through verse 14. Let me list them for you. Here are a few of the things that the Father did at the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. Things that are listed for us in those three verses. The operation of God, that's the one who is doing the action who hath raised him from the dead. There we find the operation of God. Here's God the Father raising his beloved Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, from the dead. And he goes on, And you, being dead in your sins, hath he, that's the Father, quickened together with him. That's with Christ. The Father has quickened you, having forgiven your sins, with Christ made you alive, having forgiven you all trespasses. That is forgiven by the Father. And then three things concerning the law that condemned us. All related, notice here, to a handwriting of ordinances. Remember it was written, there was a handwriting of ordinances. There was, there was something that was nailed to the top of the cross that was a handwriting. And here we have the handwriting of the ordinances, that's the laws, just like the writing that was nailed to the cross by the Romans. Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us. Fascinating, that word blotting out there. You heard me talking several weeks ago about the word anoint, and we were talking about James and the faith healers and all this, and we pointed out there are several different words for anoint. And one of those words was to smear, to rub until something is smeared. And that is the word we have here. To smear by rubbing, and it's not just to smear by rubbing so that it's sort of messy, it's smearing it out, it's blotting out, it has ek attached to it. It's completely eradicated by rubbing it out. Oh, how deep were our sins. Oh, how had they penetrated. How had they soaked in. Have you ever tried to erase something, and even after you erased it, you could still see the faint traces and outlines there of the letters. God erased it entirely. He blotted it out. He smeared it out. He rubbed it out entirely and completely. The ordinances that were against us. And then he emphasizes it again. The ordinances that were contrary to us. Not only were they against us, but there's a special pressure here with this double use of two words to emphasize how badly we were under condemnation. And then finally, taking away, taking away what? That is the handwriting of the ordinances. That's your subject, controlling all three of those little phrases there. Taking away the handwriting of ordinances that condemned us. And what did he do with it? When he took it away, what did he do with it? Nailing it to his cross. That's what the Father did with it. It was the Father himself who nailed the accusation against us to the cross of Christ. And now he has committed all future judgment to the Son. There are no pending trials for those whose accusations have been nailed to the cross. As the Father now retires from the bench and as the Son ascends the bench, 
These cases have already been indicted. They have already been tried. They have already been declared guilty. The penalty has been paid in full by Christ. The guilty acquitted and released from prison and can never again be brought before the judge to stand trial for those crimes. Do you see the incredible truth that Paul is presenting in this verse? Nailing it to his cross. As Jesus died on the cross... It was not merely the accusation of the Romans and the Jews that was nailed to the cross in Hebrew and Greek and Latin. It was not merely a condemnation based on twisted and perverted human law and justice. It was, in fact, the sentence of divine law that we had broken that was being nailed to the cross. Jesus was sinless, having neither broken human law nor divine law. We were the ones who had broken the divine law, the divine standard of righteousness. And so Jesus died in our place. The fact that God the Father nailed the sentence against us to the cross of Christ is the absolute legal guarantee that it can never be nailed to another cross on which we must hang. The accusation can never be taken off his cross and used to indict us again. The sentence has been paid in full and we can never be required to pay it a second time. But so that all the world would understand and know that the Father was fully satisfied that the penalty for our sins had been paid. So that all the world would know that the accusation of our crimes was exonerated in full. So that all the world would know that you and I will never have to suffer the divine justice and wrath against sin. God the Father nailed our accusation to the cross. The accusation upon which we should have been accused. Tried by legal trial, condemned, and then executed. There is so much more in Colossians chapter 2 at which we could look to see the extent of what was nailed to the cross. There the cross is set in contrast to the vain and empty Gentile pagan traditions and philosophies in verses 4 and 8. In Colossians 2 also the cross is set in answer to the Jewish law. It's set in contrast not only to all of the ceremonial laws and dietary laws and holiday laws and Sabbath laws, but in relation to the condemnation of all the divine law that was against us. Friends, it was all nailed to the cross. And so the accuser of the brethren can no longer point to our sinful and wicked violations of God's righteous standards. He cannot tear those accusations off the cross of Christ. He cannot nail those accusations above our heads. Do you remember what it said immediately after stating that Christ nailed them to his cross? Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, contrary to us, took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. Now verse 15, and having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. He spoiled the principalities and the powers. Satan can no longer accuse us. Because those things that were written against us were nailed to the cross of Christ. And Satan cannot rip it off the cross. Jesus spoiled openly the principalities and powers. And he nailed those things that were against us to his own cross. Oh friends, that is magnificent. How powerful that is. Satan is the accuser of the brethren, but it's in vain that he accuses us. The accusations have all already been nailed to the cross of Christ. The devil screams about it, but he's impotent. The price has been paid. Jesus shows his wounded hands and names us as his own. The accuser of the brethren... Oh, he still tries, but he is a defeated foe. Revelation 12, And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now has come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before God day and night. You remember at the head of the cross, his accusation was written 
Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. His accusation, his accusation, Satan is the accuser. But your sins and all that was against you was nailed to the cross of Christ. That's why Paul writes, But God forbid that I should glory, Galatians 6.14, save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me, and I unto the world. Oh, I know we don't have time to that marvelous verse. It's enough that we wonder at God the Father nailing the handwriting of ordinances that was against us to the cross of Christ. But there were also two other eternally significant crucifixions that took place when Christ died. And I'm, I'm not talking about the two thieves either, one on either side of our Lord. I'm talking about the two crucifixions that Paul mentions there in Galatians 6.14. Crucifixions that affect every believer. Crucifixions that place a demand on how a Christian must live. These are crucifixions that are part of a proof of a living faith. They are crucifixions that include suffering, distress, desire to go back to the old ways of life, like Israel, who wanted to go back to the leeks and lentils of Egypt. They're crucifixions that show that we mean business with God and we're not just wasting our time as we walk through the world. Those two crucifixions, he says, number one, the world is crucified unto me. Number two, I am crucified unto the world. Those are the co-crucifixions that Paul speaks of in Galatians 2.20. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. In the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. That's our position in Christ. When Christ was crucified, we were seen in him by God the Father. You see, that's why the ordinances that were against us were nailed to his cross. We were in him. It does not say, I was crucified with Christ. It says, I am crucified with Christ. That is our position in the eyes of God. As Christ was being judged for our sins and all of our sins were laid on him, we were safe, seen as safely being in him so that we did not, do not, and will never have to suffer the wrath of the Father because of our sins. Since we were safely in Christ at the crucifixion, the handwriting of ordinances that was against us was nailed by the Father to the cross. And the debt, in full, has been paid. Praise God for his marvelous, infinite, sovereign grace. Grace beyond comprehension. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Our gracious Heavenly Father. How we thank you for the cross. How we thank you that you placed us in Christ before the foundation of the world. How we thank you that the handwriting of ordinances that was against us was nailed to the cross. The debt has been paid in full. And we are forgiven. Father, the cross, infinite, majestic, Painful but beautiful. And it was there that Jesus died. In our place. And for our sins. We praise you and thank you in Jesus name. Amen.